As was mentioned, my name is Austin Sendak. I'm a PhD student in the Applied Physics Department, and I'm going to be um, talking to you about our work uh, in leveraging the power of machine learning to help us build better batteries. Uh, we like to think of this as sort of the Wild West of material science. Um, there's not a whole lot of laws, and you have to do a lot of improvising. And uh, so from time to time, you have to have a cowboy hat as well. So I will invite you to, to join me on this journey uh, through the Wild West of, of material science. And I'm, I'm not actually going to wear this, but. Uh, so um, I think there's been some great discussion so far today um, about the power of lithium ion batteries. I think Eric Toon did an excellent job in sort of framing this. Um, you know, they, they have enabled uh, an incredible amount of innovation, um, uh, you know, across the map in terms of energy technologies from automotive to electronics and, and beyond. Um, but it's no secret that uh, the, the, the batteries that we have today are not perfect. Um, there are definitely improvements to be made. Um, chiefly among those would be safety. Uh, safety needs to be unquestioned. Energy density needs to, to go up significantly. Costs can always come down. And cycle life can always improve. So these are the sort of four main challenges that we see for, um, for battery technology. And one of the difficulties that sort of is at the heart of a lot of these challenges uh, is the liquid electrolytes that are used in commercialized cells. So if you look at the schematic we, that we have here of, of uh, our battery, we have the anode and the cathode, um, which is typically uh, graphite or potentially lithium metal in the future, uh, on the anode side and transition metal oxide on the cathode. And then we have this organic solvent, uh, which is uh, between the two, that mediates the, the transportation or the transport um, of, of lithium back and forth as you charge and, and discharge. Now, these, um, these organic solvents are, are great for a number of reasons. They're very cheap. They're already manufactured at scale. They have great lithium transport properties. Um, but they are also not great for a number of reasons, um, including that they are volatile and flammable. So that's where you get your, a lot of your safety issues. Um, they're highly reactive. Their liquids in general are sort of low density. And they don't suppress dendrites, which is one of the, the main causes of, of early death in um, lithium ion batteries. And so what we're, we're working on is, you know, can we take a solid material and replace that liquid? Um, and hopefully it'll be a solid that allows us to sort of have the, you know, all the benefits of the liquids without any of these major problems. So coming back to our list here of the, the four uh, performance metrics, solids can help us because they typically are, are less flammable than liquids. Um, and much more stable. Uh, they also, because they're more stable, they, they can enable higher voltages, which can give you more energy density. Uh, if they're made from abundant materials, we could see improvements in cost. And um, they can also suppress dendrites, which could allow us to improve our cycle life. So hopefully I've convinced you that, that uh, solid state battery architectures are uh, a good way to go. Um, so you may be asking the question, well, why haven't uh, we done this already? And uh, it's not for lack of trying. This has actually been a very um, heavily uh, researched area in material science really since the 70s. Uh, it was kicked off with some, some great work from the uh, brilliant Professor Bob Huggins here at Stanford, who's uh, sitting here today with us. And, um, uh, and it's continued today. So it's, it's been a sort of an active area of research for that time. And I think this, uh, this plot here on the left shows um, sort of why this is challenging. Um, a lot of the materials that are chosen for study are sort of chosen on a trial and error basis. And this plot from RPE shows that uh, you know, there is a whole host of requirements that candidate materials have to, to all meet to be a really promising material. And so you can see that you know, if, you are, uh, if you're sort of doing a trial and error investigation and you want to satisfy eight criteria at once, uh, that's a very difficult optimization to do. So sort of the way that you know, I, I think you could frame this going from the 70s to present is uh, we start with a structure and we go and measure the properties. And if we don't like it, we grab another structure, X2, and we measure the other property, or the next property, Y2, and we repeat this n times uh, to present. And every time we, we typically get better materials, we may not have the wonder material yet, but we're generating a ton of data and a ton of wisdom. Uh, and so you, know, you could ask the question, well, how can we use that data and that information more effectively? And so what we're doing is we're reformulating this as a problem in supervised learning. Uh, and the question is, can we find the function f that allows us to take that x and predict y very quickly? And in material science, this is, of course, mapping structure to property. And so we want to know, can we effectively learn from the data that's already out there uh, to accelerate beyond trial and error? And that's, that's sort of what the hope of, uh, of machine learning comes in. So looking back at our, um, at our uh, graph here of the important performance metrics, 
Uh, we're going to start with ionic conductivity, which is just up here at the top. That's the ability of a material to conduct lithium ions. And then we'll sort of come back and, and fill in some other parts of this, of this chart. So um, we went through the literature and we were looking for examples of uh, known lithium ion conducting materials that have been published um, that have characterized structure and have uh, room temperature measurements of conductivity. We put together this list here on the left of 40 materials. Um, and then we started thinking about sort of rules of thumb that we could use to correlate structure with ionic conductivity. And we put together these, these 20 features here uh, in the middle that all come directly from the, from the unit cell, from the, the structure of the atoms, um, that may have some bearing on ionic conductivity. So the first thing that we did is we computed these 20 features for all 40 materials, uh, and we just held them up individually to conductivity and said, what does the correlation look like here? And that's what this, uh, this column here in the middle, the Pearson correlation coefficients is. And you can see that none of them are greater in magnitude than 0.3, uh, which means that none of them really on their own are very strongly predictive uh, across this broad set of materials. And so our hope is, uh, coming back here, so our, our hope is that if we can find a clever way to combine uh, these, these features together, and, and here's where machine learning comes in to help us, um, that we can get some more predictive power than we may have um, just from these features alone. So this is where we have to um, put our cowboy hats back on and come up with some way of uh, sort of forging a path forward. Uh, so we adopt a binary classification strategy, which means that if a, a material is a good ion conductor, we give it a thumbs up, and if it's not, we give it a thumbs down. Uh, that breaks our training setup here into 11 good conductors and 29 bad conductors. <laughs> Excuse me. And uh, we assume a logistic form. So this is a technique called logistic regression. This is um, you know, appropriate typically for small data sets. Um, so if uh, with 40 data points, this is, this is really a good way to go, we think. Um, and the question is, you know, the logistic uh, regression has this, fo this form, and we have this theta x here in the exponential. The question is, what is the best form of that theta x? It can be any combination of those 20 features that we looked at. And so without going too much into uh, the details of how we do this, um, you know, we, we use uh, automation essentially to build every possible model that we can from those 20 features. There's about a million models. Um, and we, we assess the performance of each one. And we find the, the, the best performing model of those million um, using cross-validation, which is a, a, essentially a way of, of gauging how well the model will predict um, connectivity in new data points. And so uh, the resulting model looks something like this. This is the, the five-feature model. There are sort of five pieces of, of wisdom that make it into this, uh, into this equation that all can be sort of easily interpreted in a, in a materials uh, sense. And um, there's some interesting physics in here, and I, I would um, point you to our paper in Energy and Environmental Science for some discussion of that. But really the main point is that uh, this equation is now um, about six orders of magnitude faster to assess than, for example, doing a simulation with density functional theory. So whereas it would have taken a week with DFT, we can now assess, you know, get, get a sort of early, quick and dirty approximation of conductivity uh, in less than a second. So uh, this equation is so fast to assess that we can now turn it loose on every known lithium-containing compound out there. And so that's what we did. Um, and as I mentioned, there's, there are other requirements besides ionic conductivity that are important. So we put together an additional six um, screening criteria, capturing things like stability. Um, these were not necessarily derived from machine learning, but rather from sort of available data uh, where we could get it. And we turned these, these seven um, screening metrics loose on the more than 12,000 lithium-containing compounds out there. Um, if we just screen on these six and not the conductivity model, we can get it down to 300. Um, of course, still too many for us to I investigate through physics-based methods. Um, but if we use the ionic conductivity predictor, then we can get this down to 21. And lo and behold, we're able to, to tackle uh, several parts of this diagram that we weren't before. So the, the list of 21 candidates is, is published in our paper, um, and we sort of published this without validation. Uh, so we, we put our necks out there on the line. Um, you know, we, we wanted to publish this without validation as a way of saying this is truly a predictive effort. Uh, we're not going to tweak our model based on, on you know, things that we have discovered uh, in the meantime. So we put this out there, and then the strategy is publish and pray that you're right. And so you may ask the next question, which is a fair question, which is how well does the model do? And so this is the, the next part of our work that we are uh, cur currently working on now with these physics-based uh, models that I mentioned are, are much more time-consuming uh, but more accurate. And so uh, what we do is we simulate these materials at high temperature. 
Uh, and then we look at the lithium diffusion and we extrapolate those, those uh, performance metrics down to room temperature. And this plot here shows the displacement of lithium in time for um, several of these materials. The slope is, is proportional to the conductivity. And what we see is that there's sort of two regimes, or actually three, three regimes here, um, four great materials that have um, conductivity sort of on par with the best materials out there. Um, uh, sort of medium regime that's, that's sort of good conductivity but not excellent, and then a fair number of materials that, uh, that don't hop at all during the, the, t the simulation time. And so if we consider these first two categories as, as good conductors, we get about a 50% hit rate. And so the, so the question is, well, how do we interpret this 50% hit rate? Um, you could look at this and say, this is a garbage model and you deserve 50% of a PhD. Um, but I think the, the true metric of, of this is, how well does this perform uh, you know, above these sort of existing, existing methods, um, which we could consider trial and error? And that's a really tough question to answer without doing trial and error. So we had to start doing trial and error. Um, so we chose these 21 materials for simulation from, from what the algorithm told us. Um, there's some subtleties in the statistics about how you count a success. Let's say 35 to 50 percent successful. And then we just started simulating things at random that were chosen uh, from this database. And we got a success rate of about 10 percent. And so this histogram here shows sort of how, how much better the results are when you're uh, listening to what machine learning is telling you. Um, this far right uh, column are the really good conductors. Uh, the far left column is the really bad conductors. And so you can see the red bars are what you, what you find with this machine learning based approach um, versus the, the gray bars, which are um, things that have been discovered at random. And so really the, the point here is that uh, learning from only 40 data points, which from the perspective of, of most people in Silicon Valley, you know, folks at Google or, or Facebook is, is like essentially zero data points uh, statistically. Um, 40 data points for us can drive a 3x improvement in the amount of discoveries we get. And we think that's, that that's really exciting. And we also have one uh, very new uh, exciting material that we've discovered through this process um, that I would love to tell you about but can't because it's not published yet. Um, but but uh, that's also very exciting as well. And so our, our final performance metric is, okay, so we can beat random guessing. Can we beat humans? Um, so this is like the deep blue, you know, the, I think Citrine mentioned this yesterday, the sort of comparison man versus machine. Um, and so what we found, uh, we, we queried some PhD students and, uh, and then compared sort of the results of that versus what the model says versus density functional theory. And we have it on this axis of uh, time on the y-axis and log scale and accuracy on the x-axis. And so you can see essentially that uh, machine learning is more accurate than PhD students. Um, less accurate than density functional theory, but most importantly, it's several orders of magnitude faster than both of them. Um, at least it looks like four, four or five more than students and uh, about 10 faster than the existing density functional theory codes. So uh, with that, I would like to, uh, to conclude and, and thank you for your attention. Um, it, essentially, we're able to leverage machine learning to do the first sort of large scale holistic screening of, of lithium ion conductors. And uh, we found that this does about 3x uh, better than random guessing based off these 40 data points. And we have several new exciting materials for, for further development, uh, as well as some, some exciting new design principles to push us forward. So as we think about the impact of 40 data points, I would just put to you, you know, what can we do with a really more extensive effort here to, to, uh, to aggregate and um, you know, learn from maybe 500 data points or 1,000 data points? I think a, there's a really exciting future in store for us. Um, if, we, if we harness our materials data. So with that, um, thank you for your time and happy to take any questions. Uh, have you thought about uh, coupling uh, machine learning method with DFT to do active sensing to, so that you can increase your uh, training data set? Yes, and, th and that's, that's a great question and that's actually something that we're working on now. Um, I think that'll be a, a great way to gather more data. Absolutely. Um, could you comment on the mechanism of conductivity and if you, if you uh, lump your data and group your data in, into different mechanisms of conduction, does your model work better or worse? Yeah, so the, the mechanism of conduction is a, a really interesting part of this. Um, and we wanted to train the model to be sort of mechanism agnostic um, so that we wouldn't have to spend time kind of figuring that out. Um, 
I think in the case that you have, if you have enough data to be able to, to make that split and you know the mechanisms ahead of time, you're probably going to get a much more accurate model because then you have different sort of phenomena that are more important. Um, but at least in our initial screening, we, we sort of kept that, that knowledge out of it. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.